When soldiers go away to war, their thoughts are likely to be about going into battle or being wounded. They don't spend a lot of time thinking about being taken prisoner. So if they are captured, it can be a shocking event. That may be why all the former prisoners interviewed for this archive remember in exact detail the day they were captured, whether that was in Greece or Crete, North Africa or Malaya. Sergeant Malcolm Keshen, for example, was captured by the Germans in Greece during World War II. On the 6th of April 1941, the Germans invaded Greece and Yugoslavia, and 17,000 Australian men and women, 40,000 British and New Zealander troops, and the Greeks themselves, faced the invading German panzer division. Sergeant Keshen was just 21 years old. Well, we came down out of the hills, and you got no idea what the bedlam was. There was blacks everywhere without rifles. They'd thrown everything away, and they were just marching out. A voice said, put your arms down and turn around slowly. And I looked over my shoulder, and it was a German. He had his gun train on there. And it all sort of happened in a flash. But to me, it was slow motion. So I thought I'd got no option. There was a creek alongside the road, so I just threw the gun out and I turned around slowly. I was a prisoner of war. Around 10,000 Royal Australian Air Force personnel served with the strike force called Bomber Command in the Second World War, flying out of Great Britain on raids across Europe. Almost three and a half thousand of them would die. They were mostly very young men with an average age of just 22, and they had a 35% chance of not coming back. Over a thousand of them were captured, generally after they'd been shot out of the sky. Rex Austin's moment came in a Lancaster bomber in the night sky over Germany on the 22nd of May, 1944. He was 20 years old. We got uh, attacked by a night fighter, a German night fighter, and they put the uh, starboard wing on fire. The petrol tanks, of course, are in the wings of these aircraft. Our pilot, Kevin McSweeney, turned around and said, get out of here. The field I landed in was ploughed. Remember, you're going out at half past 12 at night, so it's as black as the inside of a cow. There are no lights on on the ground. You have no points of reference to see where you're going to land. And I hit the ground pretty hard. My flying boots had come off when I pulled the ripcord because of the sudden jerk. I didn't realise I'd been hurt until I went to stand up, and then I realised that I had a broken ankle. I won't say... Um, that I was petrified or anything like that. But, but I was cold, wet, miserable, and, and when I went to stand, all I realised that all I could do was hop, not, not walk. So I sat myself back down on the ground again, pulled the parachute over the top of my head, and, and said, that's it, that's it. In early 1942, Japanese troops moved through Southeast Asia with stunning speed. So quickly did they advance that tens of thousands of people suddenly came under their control. Hundreds, including women and children, were murdered rather than being taken prisoner. The rest were forced into camps. Most of the Australians captured by the Japanese in the Second World War were imprisoned during that time. 36% of them, over 8,000 men and women, would die in captivity. The city of Singapore had nearly fallen when all the Australian Army nurses were ordered out. Some sailed on a ship called the Empire Star, which made it back to Australia. But Pat Darling was one of the nurses on another ship, the Viner Brook, and when it was bombed, the nurses had to go overboard. There were dead bodies floating around already because people had jumped overboard and the, the life belt had gone up and would have broken their necks as they hit the water. We found a spur and hung on to it for a long time. 
About eight o'clock next morning, we were still struggling and we were well and truly, we were probably only 200 yards from the shore at the stage so you could see the Japs and the uh, shore. We didn't know which way to pull the, try and pull the thing. Anyway, they came out in a boat and they were quite kind and gentle. They pulled us on board. Then they took us to a house. There was a dead Indonesian lying nearby and the little Japanese, who was quite a polite little fellow, was showing us around and telling us to take what we wanted. We didn't like to take very much. He took from the uh, wall a mirror and showed me myself and I was horrified. My hair was full of black oil. Ships have an amazing amount of oil and my face was purple, my skin's, my eyes were scarlet and I sort of went, oh, how terrible. And of course he doubled up with mirth, which I was relieved at because it was a normal reaction. And, that, and one just thought, you know, thank goodness they're human. 1,500 Australian civilians were also captured by the Japanese. Many were children. Sheila Brune was just 17 years old when the Japanese marched her into Changi Jail. On the 8th of March, we were told that we were going to Changi Prison, so we marched there, the eight miles, in the hot sun. Some of the locals cheered and some of the locals jeered, threw things at us. We had dogs following us, and if we didn't walk, we got prodded with a, with a uh, butt of the rifle and uh, things like that. We were hungry, we were thirsty, we were dusty. Children were crying, pregnant and women were tired. It was chaos, but when we, when we saw the jail, the British women started to sing, they'll always be in England. And the men that had already been there before us clapped. One of the most difficult of circumstances was for a soldier to be captured when wounded because medical care was sometimes deliberately withheld by the enemy in an attempt to gain information. This was particularly so in the Korean War. On the 25th of May 1953, while on patrol, Lieutenant Charlie Yakapetti and his men were ambushed by the Chinese army. They were doing well till a grenade was thrown. I heard the explosion. Didn't feel the pain straight away, you just feel like burning. You know, something burning into your buttocks and flanks. And then you can just feel the blood flowing <laughs> your flanks. <laughs> and, uh, and then you start to feel a bit sick and queasy. And you realise, you know, as the realisation dawns that you've copped it. I got up and started to follow them, and that's when I got a oh, couple of bursts of machine gun fire around. One hit me on this ankle, the other one hit me across here. I woke up, face down, with a Chinaman sitting on my back. <laughs> How long after, I don't know. And I got grabbed by the wounded arm, uh, mate, and got dragged on my side, up the, up the valley. Oh, it hurt like mad, I screamed like mad, and obviously that didn't please them because you, know, you can still hear the battle going on up there and there's shelling and mortar and falling, not near us, but falling around. I don't know whether they thought that my scream might alert them to where I was and they might get mortar, but I got a swift boot in the back. I think it was probably a rifle butt I got hit with the, as, as I was lying on the ground to shut up. Oh, that shut me up all right. <laughs> Not many sailors were taken prisoner because the sinking of a ship could kill so many men. HMAS Perth had 681 men on board when she encountered a Japanese invasion fleet in 1942. Hit four times by torpedoes, the Perth sank and 350 of that crew lost their lives. The rest, like Petty Officer Ray Parkin, were in the water trying to survive. But then we suddenly found ourselves faced with another problem, and that was oil fuel. The 
ships being torpedoed had bled all this oil fuel out onto the water. And where we were, there was about three inches of it on top of the water, this black treacly mess. And we had to swim amongst it. And uh, when you're swimming, your head's pretty close to the water. And um, if the water's disturbed, you, well, there was enough activity in the movement of ships and that around us, it was causing the surface of this to be little dollops. And if they slopped in your face and you got them into your mouth or nose and happened to inhale a bit, well, you'd start coughing and you get, you know how you get out of control. And you'd probably gulp more in. And it was a sure way of drowning in the most painful way. Of course, it was getting into our eyes, which were burning. We couldn't prevent that. But um, there were a lot of people I heard. You could hear, you know, around you blokes and... Uh, you'd hear this horrible coughing and gurgling and then a bloke would just go. There was no way. Many soldiers at the moment of capture suffered from depression and a sense of complete failure. They faced the prospect of a bleak and useless future and they felt humiliated by their imprisonment. Alexander Barnett and Lloyd Moore were both captured by the Germans in North Africa in 1941. The order was to surrender, put your hands up. But I don't know whether they had a flag or what, I don't know. I do remember putting my hands up. But it, it's, a, it's a horrible feeling. You think you've let somebody down. Terrible feeling, a feeling of, of, of almost of hopelessness. Hopelessness. You felt, uh, you felt sad. You felt angry, and and these mixed emotions were sort of taking over. You know, you know, what's happening? You feel you've done something wrong, but if you look at it in hindsight, you've been wronged. It's a, a very difficult question, very, very hard to comprehend. And, and, and you think, what else could we have done? The Germans loved to say, for you the war is over, when they took prisoners. And perhaps that was true. Or perhaps it was just that one kind of war was over and another had begun an intensely personal war that would test the prisoners' strength and courage in the months and years to come. <laughs>